amazing passage. And we're talking about today what happens on the mountain of the Lord. Practically, in reality, if you like, in this circumstance, but also in a sense, metaphorically, what happens when we're on the mountain of the Lord? For this story has relevance not just for Abraham and the people of Israel, but it has something to say to every single person here today. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, we are in the context in Genesis 22, in the context of what's been going on in the adventure of faith that Abraham has been living since Genesis 12, since God called him to leave his father's household, his, his, his uh, the circumstances where he grew up, and to travel. And over the years, as you know, he has developed a greater and greater depth in his relationship with God, as God has taken him through many different experiences. And some of those are things that God caused, and some of the experiences, frankly, are also because of Abraham's own sin and weaknesses, as with Pharaoh in chapter 12 and with uh, Abimelech and other situations with Hagar and his son Ishmael. But he's learned as he's gone along, he's learned about how to intercede when he interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah and the situation uh, with, uh, with, um, uh, with Lot and his family. And just immediately before this in chapter 21, Isaac has been born. The son of the promise has been born. And we've seen much grace given to Hagar and to Ishmael. And we've also seen the consequences of fear in chapter 21 as Sarah gave in to her fear over uh, what was going to happen to her son, Isaac. And now we see that Isaac not only threatened there in her mind by uh, the presence of Ishmael, but now we see uh, the the possibility of Ish, of Isaac's future being threatened by God Himself, asking asking Abraham to do something that is well unthinkable. So let's put let's go through the passage a little, and then we're going to have some time for question and discussion. And what we see here is uh, first of all that uh, Abraham is tested in verse one. It says God tested Abraham. So what did that mean is it isn't it it's not really fair is it of God to to test Abraham so what when we look at biblical testing biblical testing is not about like passing an exam exactly it's about revealing what's truly in a person as they go through difficulties and challenges uh it's and, and people go through times of testing as we all do in the in the bible this is the only time in the whole of scripture that God is recorded as specifically testing an individual person. Circumstances test people, but this is the only time in the whole of Scripture that it says God tested someone. So that means that Abraham was given a very significant honor. He might not have felt like it was an honor, but it is a specific honor that he is given. And it also must mean that we sit up and take notice because we're seeing something which is only seen once in the whole of the Bible, Old Testament and New. So he's tested and he's told to take his son, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, an emphasis there on the relationship that Abraham has with Isaac. It's not one son out of many. It is your son, only son, whom you love, Isaac. And when God says take, it's an interesting thing that actually in the Hebrew, it's better translated as please take. Please take your son, which is an interesting thing for God because it is a command. And yet God seems to accommodate for Abraham how difficult this was by saying, please take him. Uh, and then he says to go to uh, the region of Moriah. The region of Moriah is a, region, a mountainous region where uh, Jerusalem is built later. And also that's where Jesus is crucified. So we have other associations with that place. The temple is built there. Uh, why is God asking him to sacrifice his son? Now, in, in the time we have today, I can't go into the, the all the reasonings one could work through to uh, to reason out what's going on here, since it seems such a strange thing. I did post a link to an article in the WhatsApp group, and if you didn't get that, I can send it to you. Let me know later, and I'll pop it in the chat box or something. There is a good article about that you might like to look at. Certainly human sacrifice is prohibited in many places in Scripture, 
but we have to bear in mind that God isn't somebody who um, isn't a, a tenant of his creation. He owns it. So no human is permitted to take another life by sac of sacrifice. But since God owns all things, he could demand a life if he so choose. It's human beings that cannot demand a sacrifice, a human sacrifice. In Jewish tradition, looking at this passage, Jewish tradition calls this story not the sacrifice of Isaac, which is often headlined in, in many uh, Christian lessons, but Jewish tradition calls it the binding of Isaac. And by calling it the binding of Isaac, they are acknowledging that this sacrifice was never meant to take place. It was meant to be enacted to a certain point, but then to be stopped by God, which we will, of course, get onto in a minute. The Binding of Isaac. If I can quote to you from a, a book on this passage by uh, a friend of mine, many of us will know, Douglas Jacobi. I think it's in his book called Origins on the book of Genesis, the early part of Genesis. He says this about this passage. He says, God was never going to allow Abraham to kill his son. The command and the following episode were not intended to culminate in a murder, but in a repudiation of human sacrifice. In dramatic fashion, God definitely, deafeningly proclaims, no, I do not want this. I will not accept this. This is wrong. To put it another way, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, not. So that's how Doug puts it. So we're going to talk about two parts of the story and then have some discussion and we have some along the way. So firstly, we get the first part of the story from verses three to eight, where God sends Abraham to the mountain. What's going to happen on this mountain? Many interesting things happen on mountains in the Bible. Jesus prays on a mountain. He's taken up from this earth on a mountain. He does the Sermon on the Mount on a mountain. He encounters Elijah and Moses on a mountain. Uh, Moses himself uh, dies on a mountain. Uh, the, the law is given on a mountain. Mountains are very significant in the Bible. If you want a really interesting Bible study of your own, just look up significant events on a mountain. Anyway, the journey to the mountain. God sends Abraham to the mountain. And in verse 4, it says that on the third day, Abraham looked up, saw the place in the distance. Abraham's had a three-day journey. He's had a lot of time to think about what God has asked him to do. Sometimes you and I can be immediately responsive to command because we haven't got time to think about it. But imagine that you've got three days to think about, am I going to really sacrifice my son? Is God really going to rescue this situation? What does he really mean by it? Why would he ask? I mean, three days of journeying and no headphones to put on your head and listen to your favorite podcast or music. They're just journeying for three days and he sees, the, imagine when as Abraham maybe goes around a corner and then sees the region of the mountains of Moriah. Imagine what's going through Abraham's heart and mind when he sees the mountain. Okay, we're getting close now. He tells the people with him in verse 5, stay here while I and the boy go over there. This is something very interesting. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Stay here, we will worship and we will come back. It's interesting that so far the word worship has not been used in this passage, but Abraham interprets the command to sacrifice his son as an act of worship. I wonder whether he has an inkling that the worship will not involve physical sacrifice, or at least not of his son. Maybe it's maybe it's a hope. Maybe he's hiding, hiding the reality from his servants and his son. We're not quite sure. But he says, we will worship and return. Not we will worship and I will return. We will worship and return. So there's something going on here in Abraham's mind that he sees something different from what uh, it appears. So there are three possibilities. Here he could be lying, uh, saying that. He could be revealing that uh, he himself does not intend to go through with it. He's like going to go to the top of the mountain and God's going to tell him, he's going to say last minute no. Or possibly, thirdly, as you watch, we actually see, is that he trusts that somehow God is going to bring about a different outcome to that which he has so far commanded. That may remind us of Hebrews 11. Let me quote to you from Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19. I'm going to read it from the Message Translation about what's going on here. It says, By faith, Abraham, at the time of testing, offered Isaac back to God. And I like the way that's phrased, back to God, because it came from God. It's a gift. Offered Isaac back to God. Acting in faith, he was as ready to return the promised son, his only son, as he had been to receive him. And this, after he had already been told, your descendants shall come from Isaac. 
Abraham figured that if God wanted to, he could raise the dead. In a sense, that's what happened when he received Isaac back alive from off the altar. And so on they go up the mountain in verse 6 and verse 7, carrying the wood and the fire. Isaac asks what's going on. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Good question, Isaac. He's a smart chap. And then verse 8, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God will provide. God will provide. You know, that, that might be Abraham's life motto. When you look at his life from the beginning to the end, it's like that was his motto, God will provide, he says. And of course, that fits with verse 14. We'll come to in a moment where on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. His trust that God will provide is vindicated. Now, is he saying that to his son because he's avoiding an honest reply? Like, I don't know what's going to happen, Isaac. He, he, maybe he's ev evading. Or is he expressing faith in the unknown or simple, simply a desperate expression of hope? Certainly, he doesn't look like he's looking for a way out of the situation. He will do what God commands. Perhaps this is best seen as an expression of faith, because this is surely the point of the story. It's an affirmation of faith. It's more like a, almost like a prophecy or a prayer. The Lord will provide is a, perhaps a prayer. And I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of times in my life where I've offered a prayer, not out of necessarily a, a, a great deal of uh, confidence that God's going to work something out, but, but God, I trust you, you will work it out as a prayer. Please, God, help me out. So they walk on together. Interesting, they do go, Isaac goes with his father. Uh, it indicates Abraham's faith in God, and it, it indicates Isaac's acceptance of his own father's faith in God. Either if Isaac had figured out what was going to happen, that he, he didn't trust his father, or even if he hadn't, his, but his father knew what he was doing. And it implies also an innocence in Isaac that fits together with being the perfect sacrifice and fits together with the parallels with Jesus, which I think you'll have noticed by now, um, which we'll come on to a little bit later. One of the things I think that is particularly interesting about this is that we have no record of Abraham's feelings. The passage tells us nothing about how Abraham is feeling. And that's very unusual because we've had other parts of Abraham's life where it has indicated his feelings, Sarah's feelings, uh, Ishmael's feelings, uh, Hagar's feelings. We get none of that here. And I wonder a bit why that is, because he must have been feeling a lot of things. But I suppose it's left out so that we can focus more on perhaps the, the results of his faith rather than the struggle of his feelings. So God takes him to the mountain. And then once there, the second part of the story, God takes him up the mountain, shows up. God shows up on the mountain. This is the thing. God hasn't showed up yet, in a sense, but he shows up on the mountain at the time of greatest trial. And that's the second part of the story here from verses 9 down to verse 18. So what does Abraham do when he gets up there? He reaches there, he builds an altar, arranges the wood, binds his son, lays him on the altar, reaches out the hand, takes the knife. I mean, very deliberate. Can you imagine how Abraham might be feeling? <clears throat> Building an author takes some time. Arranging the wood takes some time. Binding his son. That seems to indicate that Isaac is uh, trusting of his father, of course. I um, mean, Isaac is likely a teenager at this point. And so Abraham, by the way, remember, is 100 plus. What will he be by now? 110, 113 years old. So I don't suppose um, you, an 110, 115 year old chap could forcibly bind a 13 year old boy. I think that'd be quite challenging. So we have Isaac here uh, complying. And then uh, we see that uh, the unthinkable is about to happen. It looks as if God has gone back on his promise. I don't know about you, but sometimes in my Christian life, I've had experiences that I didn't expect to have once I became a Christian. When I became a Christian in, in 1984, I thought, not exclusively, but I thought pretty much most things are going to work out just perfectly. Penny and I will have the perfect marriage. Our children will grow up wonderful. We'll be proud of everything they do. They'll delight us with everything. They'll become Christians. They'll marry Christians. They'll change the world. And all my friends and family will become Christians. And they'll all, we'll all change the world. And, and everything will be different. And... I, I don't know, you know, um, 
And yet life hasn't always turned out that way, at least for me, maybe it has for you. And sometimes it can look a bit like, has God gone back on his promises? The Christian life can be rather confusing at times. And I think Abraham felt that here. It looks like the end of everything for Abraham, as well as Isaac. They're going down a really dark alley. There's no light, it seems, at the end of this tunnel. And then, as he lifts up the knife, the angel calls out in verse 11. Abraham, Abraham, he calls out twice. You know, like that's when you're one of your young children is in danger. They're about to step off the curb and you don't shout their name once. You say whatever their name is. Let me take, let me take my daughter, Lydia. It wouldn't be Lydia. It would be Lydia, Lydia, Lydia. It would be right. And I think that's what's going on here with the Abra, Abra, the angel. He's saying, Abraham, Abraham, stop, stop, get, stop keep, keep that knife in your hand. Don't, don't slay the boy. And uh, here I am, he replied. Don't lay a hand. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. The angel calls in the nick of time, just like with Hagar, actually, in chapter 21 and Ishmael. It says the Lord. That's Yahweh. That's the covenant name. This is the God who Abraham knows personally. Do not do anything. Uh, now I know. This is an interesting thing, now I know, because doesn't God know everything anyway, really? I mean, he, of course he does. Now I know? Didn't you already know? Well, God, since he knows all things, I don't think it's uh, likely he was lacking knowledge exactly, but perhaps the point is a confirmation of his trust in Abraham and a vindication of such trust. In other words, it's a relational trust. So you and I never really know the strength of our relationship with God until we've been through a testing time. We may believe and, and say, Jesus is Lord. And yes, I will always trust him with my life and everything that happens. It's easy to say that in theory, but we only really truly know the depth of our bond with God and our understanding and appreciation of his grace when we've been through sin when we've been through difficulty and d disappointment and, and spiritual disaster, perhaps, that's when we know whether we have a real relationship with God. I think the now I know doesn't only apply to God. I think the now I know applies to Abraham. Now I know, God says, I know what this relation, the quality of this relationship really is like. And I think Abraham, Abraham could say the same thing. Okay, now I know I can fully trust you, God, because you will show up when I need. And then he uses, then he says this, this beautiful phrase here in verse 14. Verse 14, uh, he takes the ram, makes the burnt offering. Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. To this day it is said, it became a proverbial saying, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. So it's all very well to believe that God will provide intellectually, but it's a different thing altogether to experience it. And Abraham, because of his trusting and obedient faith, was able to know this, this truth better than anybody, certainly in the Old Testament, for sure. And that's why it's held up as a paragon of faith in the New Testament, because he, he really knew that this was real, it was true. I mean, Abraham had, been, Abraham had been called to sacrifice far more than anyone in history, before or since, frankly. But that meant he was able to receive a, a reward of faith greater than maybe anybody else. He experienced, a, he received an experiential assurance of the provision of God far beyond anything I think any of us have likely experienced. God provides. The word there in the Hebrew is yireh, which means see. He will see. We will see. It will become clear. God is showing up. We need God to show up, don't we? You need God to show up. You need God to show up on Monday morning when you're feeling rotten. You need, you need God to show up when one of your children isn't well, things aren't going well with your parenting. You need God to show up when your marriage is in difficulty and you're not sure if you married the right person or if it's going to work out. We need God to show up when things aren't working out with our health. Poor, I'm sorry, Taiwo, this is a tough time for you. You know, you need God to show up. You and your family need God to show up. You do. We need God to provide because medical science will provide some things, but there are some things medical science or the economists or the government or our friends can't provide. We need God to show up, to see, to provide. We see this again and again and again in the life of Abraham, but we only see it because he is willing to go further than anybody else in his trust of God. God says it's, it's because you have done this. Verse 16, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. Make your descendants numerous 
as stars and uh, sand, and he'll take possession of the cities of your enemies. This is far beyond what Abraham was expecting. He'll bless you, not simply bless you, but greatly bless you, he says here, really bless you. The sand is a new metaphor here. Uh, possess the gate um, is the phrase here. The uh, you'll take possession of the cities of your enemies or their gates of the of your city of your enemies. So in other words, you'll conquer the cities of your enemies, which indicates that his descendants will possess the land. Abraham has lived in the land. He has some land, but his descendants will conquer the land, and that will come in Joshua's time, of course. Blessed you are blessed. All nations on earth will be blessed through you. So here's what I want to do for a few minutes now. How are we doing for time? Okay, we've been going about 20 minutes. I would like to break us into some breakout rooms randomly for a bit to discuss a few questions, which I'll put in the chat box. All right. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Uh, what do we find provided at, on this mountain? We find faith provided. We find grace provided. We find answers we find a deeper relationship provided. We find uh, stronger trust provided. In fact, you could say we find salvation provided here. On this mountain, faith grew, trust grew, love grew, I would say. What's God doing? He's taking Abraham into a deeper relationship of trust with himself. Bear in mind, Abraham is already old, very old, and has had a lifetime of walking with God. But God knows, and I think that Abraham knows more and more as life goes by, that as he gets older, he's going to face more significant challenges and needs a deeper walk with God. It's been humbling for me, as, as most of you will know, my mother died recently, and it's been humbling to see, if that's the right word, to see the, um, what's the right word? to see the challenge that that's given my father uh, after their marriage of 62 years. Um, the challenge of him uh, grieving, of course, and on top of that also facing the greater limitations, limit, greater limitations in his lifestyle because of physical, physical challenges. He is 84 and has some physical challenges. Some days it takes him half a day, more or less, just to get out of bed, have a wash, get dressed, cook and eat something. That's most of your morning gone some days. And you know, that's uh, frankly where most of us are headed, like it or not. Um, that's that's going to happen for most of us. And you and I would like, perhaps as we get older, that life should get easier as we figure stuff out and that the current faith we have in God will be enough. I have not been through enough already. I believe in you, God. But the truth is the current level of faith is not enough for tomorrow or the quality of the faith isn't enough for tomorrow. So what does God do? <laughs> God blesses you and blesses me with further tests. He blesses us with tests. The tests are a blessing. And even the greater and greater tests are all blessings. Why? So that we then develop enough trust in him and depth to handle the challenges that are going to come as we get into the later stages of life. And Abraham ends up with a deeper trust and a faith in God that he probably thought wasn't even possible. How could he imagine having enough faith to be willing to sacrifice his son until it was demanded of him? And then he sees how God works it out. So he gets a deeper faith than he could have expected or even imagined. It was only accessible by being faithfully obedient to God in a situation that seemed frankly nonsensical. That God will not relent on providing us with further and greater tests, not because he delights in testing us as such, but because he knows that this is the only way for us to have access to the greater strength from him that we will need in this life. See, after these events in uh, chapter 22, I imagine that God is, not only that God is pleased with his servant Abraham, should we say, but Abraham is more at peace. I think Abraham is able to relax in this new and deeper faith with God, knowing that whatever comes next is something that he can handle now that he's got that greater access to God's strength and presence. Think about uh, James chapter two, and I'll read you this from the New Living Translation. James two, verse uh, 21 to 23 says, don't you remember 
that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called, and this is the phrase, the friend of God. The friend of God. You and I um, have this opportunity to be friends with God. But it comes through times of testing, that, that real friendship. And this is true for those who have had close friends or in our marriages. Our marriages are deeper when they've been through a time of testing. And fear, all through Abraham's life with him and Sarah and, uh, and Hagar, fear has been a major theme in all the chapters running up to this. But here we see fear overcome in the greatest test imaginable. Quite something. So, perhaps some questions for us to contemplate, pray about. What are we most afraid of? <clears throat> what are we, what's going on in our lives right now where perhaps fear is dominating rather than faith? Is the fear of the things going on around us blinding us to the nature of God and the fact that this test can provide us with a greater depth uh, with him? Perhaps God's got some exciting things in mind for us through these tests. You know, there are lots of parallels here between uh, this situation and the death of the firstborn in Egypt, you could say, in Exodus. There are parallels between offering a sacrifice here in place of the firstborn son in Israel. We got parallels with Israel's experience in the desert when God tested them. We got parallels with Israel's three-day journey into the desert in the Exodus to worship God on a mountain. We got parallels with God appearing there to give them the law and bless them who, who keep it. And we got parallels, of course, with Jesus. Isaac is the trusting son. Jesus is the trusting son. The silent sacrifice, Isaiah 53, verse 7. Uh, they travel to the mountain on a donkey. Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey. The wood is provided for the sacrifice. Jesus was sacrificed on the wood of the cross. The knife of the sacrifice here, sacrificing the ram, may parallel the spear and the nails that held Jesus to the cross and pierced his side. The ram is provided for the sacrifice on the mountain. The Lamb of God, Jesus, is provided for the sacrifice on the cross. Both Jesus and Isaac are beloved sons, long awaited and had a miraculous birth. In both situations, the father leads the son and the son follows obediently. And both sons, Jesus and Isaac, are innocent and they go willing up the mountain to be sacrificed. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? How, why would he not give us all that we need? Jesus' his own example is the inspiration. Just like Isaac was willing to go through with his father's plans for him, Jesus was willing to go through with his father's plans for him for our benefit. In that garden, just before his crucifixion in Luke 22, Jesus prayed and he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. We celebrate a son willing to obey his father so that others could be blessed. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you, first of all, for the faith of Abraham. 